keep fellowshipping. Got to do the... Ancient Chinese song called Tuning. <laughs> no. All right. How many of you are glad to be here tonight to worship the Lord? Oh. <laughs> well, I was clapping in my heart. So I need it. Let's, let's worship. Morning dawns, it's morning dawns and evening fades. You inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name. Strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. Jesus, in your name we pray. Jesus, in your name we pray. Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Your name. Strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save your name. Strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. There is no other name in which we come tonight. And Lord, I just want to pray that you would cleanse us and wash us. Because I know myself, you know, we, it's like we live in this world, we walk in this world, and it's like sometimes it feels like you're walking through mud. And, and then suddenly we got it all over ourselves. And and then we come and we want to worship. And so I just pray that you just give us a fresh cleansing of your spirit, fresh filling of your spirit, that our hearts would be upon you right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to lift up your name and to exalt you. And Lord, we just... Just pray you would just be honored and glorified and, and blessed. And also, Lord, that during this time, you'd also prepare our hearts for all that you have for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
by your great and endless mercy we have all been born anew and by your death and resurrection you did what I could never do and I'm amazed I am amazed of what your word tells me you did Lord I'm amazed I am amazed you gave it all so I might live and I'm amazed with you upon a cruel and barren hill upon Barren hill, you willingly laid down your will. You took my sin and all my sorrows from my past and my tomorrows. I'm amazed, I am amazed of what your word tells me. I am amazed You gave it all so I might live And I'm amazed With you Jesus, I'm amazed Yes, I'm amazed right to believe your words black and red that you'll come back just like you said and I'm amazed I am amazed of what your word tells me you did and I'm amazed I am amazed I am amazed of what your word tells me you did and I'm amazed I am amazed you gave it all so I might live and I'm amazed with you Jesus I'm amazed Yes, I'm amazed with you. Lord, we thank you so much for your amazing grace, your amazing love. You are amazing, Lord. You may be seated.
You are the God of the broken, the friend of the weak. You wash the feet of the weary, embrace the ones in need. I want to be You have this heart in me. You are the God of the humble. You are the humble King. Oh, kneel me down again. Oh, kneel me down again. Here. Show me how much you love humility. Oh, Spirit, be the star that leads me to the heart. are the God of the broken, the friend of the weak. You wash the feet of the weary, embrace the ones in need. I want to be are the God of the humble. You are the humble King. You are the God of the broken, the friend of the weak. You wash the to be like you, Jesus, to have this heart in me. You are the God of the humble. You are the humble King. You are the God share a couple of scriptures that tie into this next song. In Lamentations chapter 3 verse 24 it says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. You know, when we grow up you get what's my portion? What do I get? And biblical saints would realize the Lord is their portion. He's all they need. And in Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So may we just grow in realizing we only need Jesus. We only need the Lord. And just to delight in him. And this next song, if you don't know it, it's kind of a love song to really sing just to the Lord. Father 
so much for your love that never ends. Ours falters, but yours never ends. It's unfailing. It's unwavering. Lord, there is no bounds to it. No bounds. Let's all stand. Steadfast love, your steadfast love, your steadfast love overcomes. When troubles rise, you lift our eyes, your steadfast love overcomes. We will rise up singing, we will rise believing. Your everlasting promise, you will never leave us. We will rise and sing, we will rise believing you, God. Your steadfast love, your steadfast love, your 
steadfast love overflows when troubles rise your grace does not run dry your steadfast love overflows we will rise up singing we will rise believing your everlasting promise you will never leave us we will rise and sing we will rise believing you God your love won't fail your love won't fail it lifts me when I fall your love prevails your faithful through it your word declares everything you are our faithful God your love won't fail your love won't fail it lifts me when I fall your love prevails your faithful through it all your word declares everything you are our faithful God your steadfast love your stead, steadfast love overcomes your steadfast love overcomes when troubles rise you lift our eyes your steadfast love overcomes we will lift our hands, lift our hands up singing. We lift our hands believing your everlasting promise. You will never leave us. We lift our hands and sing. We lift our hands believing you, God. We lift our hands. We lift our hands up singing. We lift our hands, believe your everlasting promise. You will never leave us. We lift our hands and sing. We lift our hands, believing you, God. Your steadfast love overcomes. Your steadfast love. Your steadfast love. Your steadfast love overcomes. When troubles rise, you lift our eyes. Your steadfast love overcomes. Thank you, Lord. You know, fathers, we're singing that song. I'm. You know, my mind just went to one of the passages we're going to be studying tonight, and sometimes we fail to understand as the church that we're under a different covenant than Israel was. A lot of things that were written and a lot of things that they went through, certainly as Paul has told us, you know, they're examples to us. But their blessing their blessing was based on their performance. If you will, then God said, then I will. But when we come to the New Testament, and especially as we read there in Ephesians chapter 1, the basis upon the blessing to the believer in Christ, the church, is that in Christ Jesus, you have received all heavenly blessings in Christ and we're in Christ and Christ performed and not us and Lord you account it to us as righteousness you've imputed his righteousness to us and so tonight as we stand here how miserable we might be and how deeply we may have failed we are in Christ Jesus and that qualifies us for every blessing that doesn't mean we won't be corrected because you correct them that you love. And Lord, those are love taps when you take us to the shed and 
you start dealing with our attitudes and our actions and our thoughts and those things that you know will be damaging to us. But as far as the blessings, the only requirement is to be in Christ. And we're in you, Father, and you're in us. We thank you for that tonight. Lord, there's many we need to be praying for, and we want to pray for Susan. Uh, just having a real difficult time, stubble-filled as she's... Uh, you know, whatever's going on with her heart, her physical body, Lord, we lift her before you tonight. We love her. We pray that she could be here again next Wednesday. Just where, where, wherever she's at right there in her home as she's resting, Father, we pray you would just touch her heart. I want to pray for Leo tonight, Lord, that again, his heart needs to be healed too, Father, uh, physically. And we lift Leo before you, Father, and we just pray and uh, that you would do that. We pray for Steve. And Lord, we know that his time here on earth is you know it's not long and Lord when I saw him just a few days ago he just asked me to pray that it would speed up he wants to go be with you he's he's done with dealing with the brain tumors and all of the frustration that comes with with it Lord and so I do pray that you would either heal our brother take those tumors completely out of his brain and restore him Lord or you just take him home I like the second option for me. Just take me home, but we pray that. We pray for Pastor Bob Scott and Calvary Chapel, Oroville. Lord, we just pray that his legs would, would heal up, Father. No infection, Lord, and no difficulty, Father. Lord, we just uh, bring to you, Father, I, I think the thing we need to pray for tonight is, uh, I know for me, just with this heat, you know, and uh, it's just... It, it, Father, it can, it can affect our attitudes. I know it affects mine. And I just pray, Father, that you would uh, just still our hearts and give us peace. And one of these days we're going to a place that is, uh, well, Paul said it can't be described. I'm not going to have to deal with any more. It's just the stupid stuff of this earth. We're going to be free of it, Lord. And so we look so forward to it. But until then, Lord, bless your people, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's sons and daughters would say, amen, amen. Hey, spend a few moments uh, greeting one another before you settle into your spot tonight. And the kids make a bad, bad, uh, mad dash. Can you ask it afterwards? Right, if you guys could find your spots, we'll get moving tonight. We'll hopefully be finishing the first section of Deuteronomy, the first 11 chapters. We'll see. So, um, but I have got, I've got an announcement. We want to make sure that everybody is aware of the fact that we're having VBS here on July the 20th through the 22nd. So if you haven't got your children signed up yet, you need to do that. You can see my wife or you can see Chris Sins. 4 to 10 is the age group. Thursday, Friday from 6.15 to 8.15. Saturday, 9 to 2. And uh, so make sure you do that. And the beach trip. I know there's a lot of people missing. I, I know that a lot of people are sick. We need to pray for um, Gary and Gail. Gary's not feeling real well. They're not here tonight either. But you need to see Gail if you're going to the women's beach trip uh, they need to get the deposit in 
That's September the 8th through the 12th, and so she needs to hear from you if you're planning on going to that. Okay? I think that's all of the announcements. Hey, let's turn our Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 10. My favorite chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. Well, as we move into chapter 11, those are my two favorite chapters. And so just some really rich things uh, before us tonight. So let's just pray and we'll, we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And, you know, as we work our way through the Old Testament, uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so much of it is applicable to our lives today in the New Testament. And the things that aren't, they just give context uh, to what you quote from. In fact, Jesus, you quoted more from Deuteronomy than any other book in the Old Testament other than Psalms. And so, Lord, as we, as we work our way through that and we see the setting of it in the Old Testament and get the application from you in, in the New Testament, it's so rich. And so, Lord, as we just work our way through it tonight, we just pray that you give us ears to hear. Give us hearts. That's what's before us tonight, our heart. We're going to find out, Lord, you're far more concerned about our heart than you are about anything else. Because you know that a heart always makes a convert of the hands and the head. It's the heart that you need to deal with first. And so as we look at this tonight, Father, just speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. And again, all God's kids would say, Amen, Amen. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now, let, let me give you the setting because we're going to be leaving it in a few moments. As we started the book of Deuteronomy, we told you the outline is really basic. The first 11 chapters is Moses looking back, drawing from the failures of the nation uh, of Israel, at least the fathers who didn't go in to the promised land, and now to this next generation, he's trying to give application. And so he's looking back at the failures of the generation that didn't go in, there's a new generation here. They're about to have a new experience. They're about to enter into a different and new relationship with the Lord as they cross over Jordan. And so he's just drawing from their failures and warning them, don't repeat it. And I like that because I like to learn from other people's failures, don't you? I like to watch other people touch things that are hot. And go, wow, that was hot. And I can say, well, that's hot. And I don't need to do that. And that's kind of the, the, the reason why we study through the Old Testament. That's what Paul said it is. It's for our learning. It's for our admonition that, you know, we don't repeat the same things that they did. And so as Moses is looking back, and now he's coming to kind of the climax of that looking back, and he's going to kind of pull it together and give application. And then when we go into chapter 12 next week, he's going to be looking forward to them going into the promised land and preparing them for that. So here he goes. He's coming to the end of this, this exhortation, if you will. And he says there in chapter 10, verse 1, And at that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee out two tables of stone like the first. Now, he's been recounting this thing of, you remember when he was up on the mountain for 40 days receiving the law and the instructions for the tabernacle that he was interrupted by the Lord and said, You need to get down because the people have corrupted themselves. And I find this extremely interesting, and there's something that's going to go on in the first few verses here that you need to take careful note of. Because Moses scurries down, and he finds there that Aaron has taken the jewelry, the earrings and the nose rings and the finger rings from the people, and he has melted it and made a golden calf out of it, and they were worshiping around it in a drunken orgy. Forty days earlier from the mountain that shook, that was on fire, and that smoke bellowed from that, they heard the audible voice of God giving the Ten Commandments. They heard it. And they told Moses, this is a fearful thing. We don't want to hear any more from God. Because who's ever heard from God and lived? We've heard His voice. We have seen the mountain shake. We've seen the flames you know, leap from the top of it and the smoke bellow. And listen, you go up, you talk to God if there's anything else he wants to say, and you bring it back to us, and whatever the Lord says, we will do. How many times have you ever promised that? God, whatever you say, I'll do it. I promise you I'll do it. I promise. Forty days later, they're worshiping an idol in a drunken stupor. And they're doing the very same things that the Canaanites did. It, 
there was sexual sin involved in it as well. And when Moses inquires of Aaron, what have you done? He said, listen, man, uh, these people brought this stuff to me. I threw it in the fire and the cow came out. Really? You know, when God begins to deal with our stuff, sometimes we give stupid answers like that, don't we? Uh, like, it's the woman that you gave me, God. You and I were just fine. That was Adam's deal, you remember? You and I were just fine. We're getting along just swell, man, and things were good here. And you had to go and make a woman. And it was the woman that you made that did all of this. And then she blames the serpent. And you know how it goes. Instead of taking ownership. So back in verse 24 of chapter 9, Moses makes this statement. He says, you have been a rebellious people against the Lord from the day I met you. You've always had that bent. But I fell down before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights from the first. And, you know, and he said, I interceded for you that the Lord wouldn't destroy you. That's what Moses is saying as the intercessor. Now when he comes to chapter 10, God does not want his people starting off on this new adventure, that is the generation that perished from Mount Sinai without the word of God. So God says to Moses, hey listen, O Mo, here's what you need to do. Uh, it's time now, the Lord said unto me, hew thee two more of those tablets. You know, the ones you broke when you came down, uh, because you were trying to show the people they had broken the covenant of God. Well, make two more of those tablets of stone like you did the first time. And then come up unto me here on this mountain and make thee an ark of wood this time. Now, this is interesting. You could glibly repass it and not completely understand what is being said. He, and then the Lord says, and I will write on the tablets the words that were in the first tablets which thou breakest. Look, Moses, I know you were upset. I know that you were zealous for me. I know when you saw what you saw that it upset you. And I know that you threw those tablets down and you broke them. as kind of an illustrative sermon to these people. See, you've broken the covenant of God. You promised to keep those things. And yet, 40 days later, you've broken them. And so he says, you just bring those two more tablets up like you did the first time. I will write on them the law. You know, when we go in the New Testament, Peter says that the Word of God, every bit of it, is God-breathed. Holy men of old spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And in the New Testament, as God began to direct them under the Holy Spirit, they wrote, all graphy, is how it reads in the Greek, all graphy, God-breathed. The Word of God that we have before us tonight is God's Word, spoken to holy men as they wrote. The Ten Commandments, the moral law, God wrote himself on these two tablets of stone. And I will write on the tablets the words that were in the first tablets which thou broke, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And there's a reason for that. And so Moses says in verse 3, And I made an ark of acacia wood, and I hewed the two tablets of stone like I did the first, and I went upon the mountain, having the two tablets in my hands. And he, that is God, wrote on the tablets, according to the first writings, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you. You heard it audibly. Which the Lord spake unto you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mountain, and I put the tablets in this ark which I had made. Isn't it interesting that we find that Moses actually made the Ark of the Covenant? Sometimes we think as we're going through, you know, Leviticus and, and we're getting all the instruments that maybe one of the craftsmen made it. But here, the indication is that Moses himself actually constructed this Ark out of acacia wood, uh, two foot, four inches uh, uh, wide, two foot, four inches tall, three foot, I think it's four inches long, and overlaid with gold inside and out. On top of it was a lid called the mercy seat, and on the mercy seat were two cherubim made out of gold whose wings overcovered the mercy seat. And this is interesting. Now watch carefully here. This will be encouraging to you tonight. It's encouraging to me. And so he put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. Why did God say this time when you take those commandments down, the ones that I spoke audibly from the mountain that every person heard. 
This time when you go down, instead of throwing them down and breaking them, you're to put them in a very special place. You're, you're to put them in the Ark of the Covenant. There were two other items placed in that Ark in the process of time. One was a jar of manna and the other one was the, the rod of Aaron that budded. And there's reasons why those things were put in there. And then on the top, Moses would have placed the mercy seat. And on that mercy seat were two angels guarding it. Cherubim. Because God knows that you and I are going to break the commandments, doesn't he? How many made it through today without breaking at least one commandment? How many made it through today without breaking two, three, four? Pastor Tim says, I broke all 12 of them. Tim, there's only 10. What are you laughing about, Pastor Todd? <laughs> he broke all 13. No, you know, he knows that. So where does he put it? His law is important. His word is important to him. It's meant to be kept. But he puts it under the mercy seat. Because the Bible later will tell us that truth and mercy have met together. They have kissed one another. God's standard will always be God's standard. But God also knows something about the human being. That, that even though he, even in the New Testament, being regenerated and filled with the Holy Spirit, he still has the flesh. Wasn't that the cry of Paul when he said, listen, when I want to do good, I find in there is a law, evil is present. And the things I should do, I don't. And the things I shouldn't be doing, I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of sin and death? And then Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ that I am delivered. So then the I myself, the real me, the spirit man, serves the law of the Lord in the inward parts, although this flesh guy, this other guy uh, that wraps around my spirit, the guy that one of these days I'm going to find the zipper for and, and unzip him and leave him behind, I get a new body. That's why you get a new body, because the flesh, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. You're getting a new body, and it will be perfect. It will be perfect. But that old man, this man that you still have wrapped around you, wants to serve sin. And so the Lord commands Moses this time, take those commandments, put them in the ark. Later you'll put a jar of manna because that represented God's provision that you murmured and complained about. Your murmuring and your complaining will be under the mercy seat. Oh, and by the way, the rod that budded, Moses' rod, because you rebelled against my authority, the authority of Moses and Aaron, who I had established. And so I had to have every one of your leaders bring out a rod. And I said, the rod that buds is the guy that I've chosen to lead. And he, he wields my authority, and it fell on Aaron. And so because of your rebellion, the rod was put in there. Rebellion, murmuring and complaining against God's provision, breaking the laws of God all under the mercy seat. And so he's reminding this generation, although God holds truth as a high standard, he's still a merciful God. In the New Testament, we find that Titus writes these words, incredible words. You've heard me say them often because they're remarkable to me. Titus says in chapter 3 of his epistle, starting in verse 5, you didn't get saved because of works of righteousness which you have done. God saved you because he is merciful. And because he's merciful, when you came to him and confessed your sin, he didn't just reform you, he regenerated you in the Holy Spirit. He, he, he put his spirit in you, he gave you a new heart, he wrote your name in the book of life, and from that moment forward, you are saved. And the blessings that you experience, not like the Old Testament, as we're going to see in a few moments, based on your performance, in the New Testament, the blessings come to you because you're in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Every heavenly blessing has come to you in Christ Jesus. And if you're in Christ, they're all yours. And I think the greatest of the blessings is grace and mercy, forgiveness, kindness, love, gentleness, meekness. I even like discipline. How many like discipline when the Lord does it? Because he only disciplines those that are his, and he only disciplines them that he loves. And so if you're being disciplined, hey, you're a child of the king, and it's a good thing. Amen? Well, here's what he goes on to say. He says, so I did what the Lord said, verse 6. And the children of Israel took their journey. 
And now he's going to kind of rehearse some of the stopping spots. But then he's going to go back in verse 10 to the mountain. He, can't just, he just can't get away from that thought of what they had done. And then he's going to address it. And so he says there in verse 6, And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Israel and Jaakon and to Moserah. And Aaron died along the journey, the high priest Aaron. And, and this is, isn't it a beautiful picture that he brings Aaron's name up when, when he's trying to remind him not to fail? Because Aaron was to be the assistant to Moses. You remember Moses said, I don't speak well, and, and so I don't want to go. And he said, well, I'll send Aaron with you. And Aaron can do the talking, and you do the, you do the miracle thing. Uh, you'll be a tag team. And so when they went, uh, Aaron was, of course, he's related to Moses. And as they went, you know, Moses and Aaron were always the, the two there dealing with Pharaoh. They were there leading the nation of Israel. Moses was the one who sinned. Sinned horribly, did he not? But we read in a few chapters, he becomes the high priest. How can a guy who is supposed to be a leader of Israel, an elder, an example to these people, how is it that this man who caused him to commit idolatry, and not only idolatry to sin against the Lord in a drunkenness and a very crude manner, how is it now that he becomes the high priest? Well, we read through it. You remember when they put the robe on him and then the covering, uh, the apron, and then the breastplate, and then the headpiece, and then the satchel. When he was all dressed, standing at the tabernacle door, what did they sprinkle him with? Blood. And then Moses applied it to his ear, and to his big thumb, and to his big toe. And that was to indicate to Aaron, only listen to the things that are right, truth. Only handle the things that are honorable. Only go to the places that are proper. You're a man of God. His failure never kept him from being the priest. And guess what the Bible says? You are in the New Testament. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a special people. God called you out of darkness in this marvelous light that you might show forth the praises of him who did this for you. How did you get there? Why do you get to wear a robe? Why, why do you get to stand before a holy God someday and be elevated to a place of prestige where you're going to be seated on the same throne that Christ is seated as he's seated on his Father's throne? How is it that the church gets to judge angels and rule and reign with Christ forever? How is it that we get to wear the Stephanos, the, the victor's crown? One reason. Not because we performed well, but because the blood of Christ, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, was applied to you and me. The same way Aaron became the high priest. And so Moses mentioned where Aaron had passed away. Because that was a temporary priesthood. But there's the eternal one coming. That's the idea. And so Aaron passed away and Eliezer ministered in his stead. He took over the priest office there. Verse 7 says, From thence we journeyed to Gudgoda. Who names these places? Uh, you know, <laughs> there, there has to be an event that takes place there because they usually name... Uh, places in the Old Testament after something that took place. And so a long time ago, I used to look up the names and kind of figure out what happened, and it was fun. But uh, now I just try to pronounce the names and move on. A and from <laughs> Gugada, they came to Jobath. And we know that the reason Jobath means is because there were lots of rivers there. It was where some streams had come together. And at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to stand before the Lord to minister unto him and to bless in his name unto that day. The nation of Israel, these 12 tribes, one of them was set aside and they were not going to inherit land when they got over on the other side. They knew that because God, as we sang that song tonight, would be their portion, would be their inheritance. And listen, truly, tonight, listen, guys. This earth is not our possession. Do you understand that? Uh, we work so hard gathering things that are going to burn. Now I tell you, there's 41 families that live between here and Orville, right outside of Bangor, that understand that one day everything that they own is going to burn. Did you see the pictures? 41 homes. I think over 100 outbuildings. 
Did you see the one picture? I almost cried when I saw it. There was a 1965 or 66, I didn't get to see the grill, Chevy Impala SS on fire. It had the original rally wheels. I saw that. That was a classic. I couldn't read the emblem because it was already on fire. I didn't know it was 327, but they made a 427 model. It almost made me cry. But listen, that Shelby I have in my garage, one day will burn. Everything of this life is going to burn. We should be more concerned about the things that are eternal than the things that are temporal. And I think that's the idea here with the Levites. Listen, you don't get temporal things. You get eternal things. I'll be your portion. And so the nation of Israel uh, had the tribe of Levi divided from them. And their job was to put a hand on God and put a hand on the people. They were to be the intercessors. They were to be the intermediaries. They were to be the ones that did all of the sacrifices for the sins of the nation of Israel. And then verse 10, his mind goes back now and he says, and I stayed on that mountain according to the first time 40 days. You know, Moses just can't kind of leave that alone. And for 40 days, I was up on that mountain again. And I was there, you know, interceding for you guys is the idea. And the Lord hearkened unto me. The Lord listened to me at that time also, and the Lord would not destroy you. And I spent another 40 days on that mountain on my face, seeking God that he wouldn't destroy you because of that stupid golden calf. No wonder Moses ground that thing up in powder and put it in water and made him drink it. You want to get drunk with a golden calf? I'll give you a drunken golden calf, and you're going to drink it. And they drank it. I think that, so he, he, he can't get it out of his head. And he says, and the Lord said unto me, arise, take thy journey before the people. Okay, enough is enough, Moses. I've forgiven them. You've got the Ten Commandments now in a place where mercy will cover them when they fail. I won't utterly destroy them. I will discipline them. Now that you have the word of God again, and it's there with my presence and my mercy on it. Take your journey. Arise, take the journey before the people that they may go into the, and possess the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Now listen very carefully. The, re, the next few verses are my absolute favorite. In fact, I've been invited to speak at the Berean Call Conference this year in August. And the first uh, one of my uh, sessions, I get two, is going to be on this text. Every time I read it, it so impresses me because God communicates to his people in the Old Testament and I think that it's applicable to you and I here in the New Testament. This is God's heart. You want to know what the Lord desires of you? Here it is. And it's not complicated. You know, when we come to the New Testament and Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Herodians, as we've been seeing, they had taken 10 basic commandments and made them 613. They had in the Talmud 24, uh, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, they had 24 chapters on how to keep the Sabbath. When God just said, hey, six days shall a man work on the seventh day, he needs to rest and just give that to me. Because I worked on six days, on the seventh day I rest. And it was to be a type of the rest that we would have in Christ. And it's amazing how man twists things. But here, verse 12, listen carefully. Listen, care listen with your heart. Listen with the spirit man. And now. The idea when he says, and now, as I'm getting down to the serious stuff, I rehearsed your past, or at least the past of your fathers, who failed to be obedient, who rebelled against the Lord. I rehearsed their failures and how God dealt with that. I've told you of all the miracles. I've, we've gone over all of that. Now we're coming to the main point. And he says, and now... Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require? And you can circle that word require. It's, it's an interesting word. It actually means to demand, to expect, and to demand. Uh, let me ask you, does God have a right to demand things of us? Does he have a right to demand things of us? Now, notice carefully the structure, the Lord thy God. If he is the Lord, your God, then he does have a right to demand things of us, does he? doesn't he? In fact, especially you and I sitting here tonight, because not only did God create us, and he is the Lord our God, whether we accept it or not, but those of us who are born again, he has redeemed us. 
He has purchased us back out of bondage into freedom. He's taken us from darkness and placed us into light. He's taken a dead heart and made it alive by putting a new heart in us. He's put a spirit back in us. We who have been born again, listen, we've been purchased twice. We belong to the Lord as his act of creation, but then we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. We've been bought with the price. We are not our own. And I find it so amazing today in so many pulpits as people will send me messages and listen to this or read that or I hear things going on as though you were in charge, as though I were in charge. And challenging whether God had a right to say that or to do that. How dare God choose who I marry? Or I, I don't even believe I'm, I want to be the sex that I am. I think I'll just... And, and there's some ridiculous things going on, really. I will tell you, you are who you are because God made you just to be that person. Because the psalmist declare unto us that before you ever were assembled, your pieces and parts were laying around heaven and God knew you. In fact, God knew you before the foundations of the world. He knows not just how many hairs you have on your head, not just the number, but he's numbered them. He knows your thoughts before you think them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you are distinctly unique. And God loves you. And we're going to see in a few moments that his commandments are for your good. But does he have the right to say, thus saith the Lord, and expect you and I to be obedient to that. Does he have the right? Are these commandments or are they suggestions? Uh, is it a smorgies that we get to take the ones that we like and, and say, you can put some of that on my plate, but I don't want any of that. You can just keep that. I, you know, I don't like that. But I like a lot more of that. You know, and when you get to the end where they have the dessert, you say, pile that on. Give me some of that apple pie or that apple crisp and you can put a lot of, just keep putting the vanilla ice cream until I say stop. And then the whipped cream on the top. You know, that's how we want to live as Christians, but we don't. Listen very carefully tonight because this is, is, is applicable to us in the New Testament as it was the time that God told Moses to tell this to the nation of Israel. And now Israel, what doth the Lord require? What does he demand of thee? But to fear him. What does that mean? To, to shrink back from him? Um, no. Uh, the idea is rever rever reverence to the point of honor. Reverence to the point of honor. That you stand in awe of who he is and what he's done for you. Let me ask you tonight, do you stand in awe of who he is and what he has done for you? You know, um, my day off, Friday, Saturday, I'm going to take my two grandsons that are here camping. And I want to do that because they're at the age where now they understand. And I can't wait till it gets dark and I can point to the heavens and say, you can see in the northern hemisphere, we can see about 3,000 stars. There's actually millions of them, but we can see about 3,000 with the naked eye. And I've got one of those little things on my phone that you can stick up. It's called Sky Map, and they'll tell you where the planets are and the stars are. And it has names that we've given them. But I want to remind them, God named every planet and every star. And he spoke them into existence. And scientists tell us that this, this universe that we live in is about 8 million light years across. Traveling at the speed of light, it would take you that far to get... And, and listen, all of it's created inside of God. So how big is your God? Is his arm short that he can't save you to the uttermost? Listen, is he deaf that he doesn't hear? I want to remind them of who God is. Because nature is a revelator of who God is. The Bible says the things that are made clearly speak of an invisible God and His power. And then I want to talk to them about simple cells. And I mean, I got a, lot of, I got a whole list of things I want to talk to them about. Just like I talk to my son. 
Now I get to do this with my grandsons. Because I want them to know that they ought to stand in awe of God. And there should be this reverential kind of a honoring, this fear toward Him. You should stand in awe of Him. In fact, you should be in such awe of Him that you're afraid of disappointing Him by breaking His commandments. That's the idea here. Hear, O Israel, what the Lord doth require of thee. First, to fear the Lord your God. And then secondly, to walk in His ways. How you live your life should be according to how God has commanded you to live your life, to walk in His ways, not your ways. You know, I, I can't tell you as a pastor how many times I've talked to people and, and they'll say, well, you know, uh, they'll come in for premarital counseling. And I do so much premarital counseling for people that don't even attend this church. My first question is because I don't know them. Are you keeping yourself sexually pure? Well, why would you ask that question? Because it's pertinent. Because we're trying to find out God's will here. And is, is God calling these two people to be spiritually put together? Not, we're not trying to find out the will of the flesh. And if you guys have been sexually active, money the water, we can't tell now whether it's God's will or not. You come here because you want Christian premarital counseling. So I'm asking the question, have you been sexually active with each other to this point? And sometimes they'll say things like, yes, but God knows our heart. And I say, he absolutely does. It's desperately wicked. He does know your heart. Well, God knows that we love each other and we're eventually going to get married. So that's your way, right? That's your way. That's not his way. He's told us in the Word what his way is. His way is, is that you don't get to even kiss her until you put a ring on her finger because those kisses don't belong to you. I tell the young girls around here, Pastor Aaron, Avery, some little boy wanted to kiss her at school. And uh, she did this because I've told her, I said, you just tell him, close your eyes. Then you double up your fist and you give him a pop. And she did it right on the lips. Because that doesn't belong to you until you put a ring and enter into a covenant relationship. But God understands. Yeah, He understands. That's why He wrote it down. Don't do it. Because He knows the multitude of things that are fractured by that. Number one, down the road, researchers tell us that women who have been sexually active with their husband before they were married have less respect for him after as a spiritual leader. There is guilt and shame that enters into the relationship because of that. There is a myriad of things that happen when that transpires. That's why God says, don't do it. He says, you ought to fear the Lord. Number two, you need to walk in His ways. Because His ways are without contestation. And to love Him. There is to be this passion toward Him. This love for Him. Um, you know... Love will make you do some really stupid things. Have you noticed that? I, I remember when I was in fifth grade, there was this gal named Marion Owens, and she looked like literally olive oil on Popeye. I mean, she was built like that. And, but man, she caught my eye. I, I think it was the first awakening that girls were, didn't have cooties, and she sat next to me, and, and I passed by her house when I was walking to the school I went to, and I'd always wait for her to come out, and I'd walk her to school. Marion Owens. I worked all day in my grandmother's yard plucking weeds to earn $2 to go down to the 10 and dime store. I don't think they even have 10 and dime stores anymore. To go down to the oh, five and dime store. To go down to the five and, five and dime store and buy a sapphire ring. Two bucks. See, love will make you stupid. Love will make you work in the hot sun all day long for two bucks to buy a sapphire ring to, to, to give to a girl that probably doesn't even know you even exist other than you're always hanging out in front of her house waiting for her to come out so you can walk to school with her. Making excuses, you know, like you're trying to tie your shoe for 30 minutes while she's, you know, just... But if you love the Lord, if you love the Lord, what would He ask of you that would be too much? What could he instruct you to do that you would not be willing to do? Fear him. Walk in his ways. Love him. And serve him. Serve the Lord thy God with all 
thy heart. Don't do it begrudgingly. Don't do it legalistically. Don't do it because you have to do it out of a sense of duty. Do it because you love him. Because you love him with all your heart and with all of your soul, which the idea is your mind, will, and emotions. Keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day. And what are the next three words? Read them out loud. Who's it for? For your good. You, you do these things because there is a blessing that comes upon you for doing them. And then God tells us why he has the right to ask this in verse 14. Behold, the heavens and the heavens of heavens is the Lord's. Thy God, it belongs to him. And the earth also with all that is therein. It's his. You and everything here belongs to him. He owns it. Thus he has the right to command and, and demand certain things of us. Then he says this in verse 15. Uh, that's the reason why, but here's the motive. Only the Lord hath a delight in thy fathers to love them. You need to love him and serve him because he loves you. In fact, he only has the delight in these chosen people. And by the way, you are the apple of his eye is the church. Did you know that? Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even above all the people of the earth to this day. He chose you. You're sitting here tonight because God chose you. Now, I don't understand how all of that works. I just understand what the Bible says. Ephesians is, is very clear about it. That you were chosen in Christ before the foundations of this world. We know that we are chosen. We don't understand how God chooses. I personally think because he knows all things, he knows the choices I'm going to make, that he chose me. I don't know. Maybe you think another way. But the fact of the matter is that he delights in you and he has chosen you. And he expects you to return that same passion to him. So he says now, so then, because of that, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your hearts and be no more stiff-necked. Stop being rebellious. I tell you, there's a little rebellion in all of us, isn't there? How many like rules? How many cop an attitude? I mean, like, how many have been pulled over recently? I haven't been pulled over in like almost 30 years. Better knock on wood. I don't want to get pulled over on the way home. But I haven't, had a, I haven't had a ticket in so long, they mailed me my license. It's either out of pity or... In fact, they finally said that they mailed it to me so many times that they said, you need to come in uh, just to make sure your eyes still work. You've got to pass an eye exam. And then I think there's three or four questions I had to answer, maybe five. And they gave me my license again. Um, now watch me get in a wreck on the way home or get a speeding ticket. But how many cop an attitude when a cop pulls you? What's he want? Well, you're breaking the law. That's what he wants. Does he have a right to pull you over? Yeah. Um, I remember I did get pulled over before Mikey went in the army. We were driving home. We were talking. And, you know, yeah, you get to talking and sometimes you're swerving a little bit. And, and a sheriff pulls me over. He goes, uh, where are you coming from? And Mikey said, we're coming from church. It was a Wednesday night. He goes, well, I saw that, you, you know, you were kind of swerving a little bit. And he goes, ah, oh, we were just talking. And my dad, he talks with his hands. He's a preacher. Oh, okay. Well, just checking. You need to keep both hands on the wheel. Talk when you get home. I said, thank you, sir. And off we went. You know, circumcise your heart. Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be stiff-necked. God loves you and he redeemed you. He's chosen you. He's going to bless you. What he wants back from you is that you would stand in awe of who he is. You'd honor him. And you'd walk in his ways because they're best for you. That you'd love him like he loves you. And you'd serve him. You belong to him. All the earth belongs to him. That baby crying belongs to him. And that's okay. I like the sound of it. No, you can leave him in here. He needs to hear the word, brother. He'll be a mini-me one of these days. He's already a mini-me. He looks just like you. You wait till he starts preaching to you like my son did, man. 
circumcise therefore the foreskins of your heart and be not stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and He's the Lord of lords. He's a great God. He's a mighty and terrible God and He regards not the persons nor taketh reward. He had to turn the page. He regards not, regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. You can't bribe him. He doth execute judgment on the fatherless and the widow, and he loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. God loves strangers. God loves the down and out. Do you know that? The broken and the hurting. And so he says, because I love them, you better love them. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shall thy serve, and to him shall you cleave and swear by his name. Don't associate with the gods that you're going to see when you cross over this Jordan, is the idea. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, and he hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eye has seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt and three score and ten persons, 70 persons went down and God brought out of Egypt a great nation, about three million of them. And that's interesting when, when, when he talks about um, the stars. Like I said, you can see about three million stars with the naked eye in the, in the southern hemisphere. When we were down in New Zealand in the, uh, in the southern hemisphere, we were looking up and you could see the, uh, the southern cross and there's some things down there you can see that you can't see here. But three million, as the stars of heaven came out. Now watch what he says in, in chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, in light of this is the idea. That, uh, wow. Was that an amen or a sneeze? <laughs> yeah. In light of this, therefore, he says this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You shall love him. That's a commandment. Not an option. But who wouldn't? And keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments some of the time. Most of the time. What's it say? Always. Oh, don't you want to do that? Isn't that your heart to keep his commandments? to always respond to every situation in a way that's honorable and pleasing to the Lord. Amen. To know that He owns all of your heart and not just some or most of it. That you do stand in awe of Him. You do honor Him. You, you do walk in His ways. You want to serve Him. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep His charge and His commandments and His judgment always. And know Ye this day, Moses would say, for I speak not with you children which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, and his miracles and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt and Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt, and in his land. And what did he unto the armies of Egypt, unto their horses and unto their chariots, how he made them... Uh, how he made in the water of the Red Sea to overflow. And as they pursued after you, and the Lord your God hath destroyed them unto this day. You saw, you witnessed, although you're a new generation, and your fathers rebelled, you were still there. Most of these guys would be about in their late 50s now, if they were teenagers coming out. 40 years has gone by, and they were children, so most of them have seen this. He said, you've seen. You've been an eyewitness to the things that God has done. And then he says this in, in verse 5. And what did he do unto thee in the wilderness until you came here to this place? You remember there what happened to Dothan and Abiram. Remember Korah? And the gang that came out and rebelled against Moses and how the ground opened up and swallowed them. Remember that? That was pretty awesome. He said this. And you do remember Dothan and, and, and Abiram and the sons of of Eliab and, and of the sons of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all of Israel. But your eye have seen all of these great acts of the Lord which he did. Therefore you shall do all the commandments 
which I command thee this day that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you go in to possess it and that you may prolong your days. Listen carefully. You may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed the land that flows with milk and honey. For the land which thou possesses or goes in to possess, listen carefully, it is not as the Egyptian land. And I like the way they put it here. Watch this. Where you sow your seed and then you water it with your feet as a garden of herbs. You don't have to irrigate the land I'm going to give you. When you study ancient Egypt, they had quite an irrigation system from the Nile River to grow their crops. That's why the empire grew so mighty and so great. And they had the time because you have to have a good food source a plentiful food source in order to create the kind of empire they did and build the structures that they did. Hundreds and thousands of workers they would have took to build those things and they had to have a food source to support it. And many of the archaeologists tell us they found foot pumps where the Egyptians with their feet would pump the water up out of the Nile and irrigate their crops. That would have been very hard work in, the, in that uh, northern African sun but God says to them, but the land which you're going to, to possess, the land is of hills and valleys, and it drinketh up the water and the rain from heaven. And the land which the Lord thy God careth for, his eye of the Lord thy God is always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end. I'm going to irrigate it, the Lord says. I will send the rain in the season, the early and the latter rain. I will water your crops. You're not going to have to work that hard when you get there. I'm going to bless the land. And he says, if you, and we're going to see this in just a few moments, but notice back in verse 9, to prolong your days. How long do you think they were in the land? You would have thought that once you crossed over the Jordan, you got into that kind of land that flowed with milk and honey, that the rain came down and watered the crops. You didn't have to have any artificial irrigation. The fruit of it, in, in fact, when they brought back the grapes, they were the size of, of grapefruits. A cluster was on a pole. They were going into a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And they were there for 490 years. And then whisked away to Babylon because they didn't obey. Watch what he says in verse 13. And it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently. Here's that word again. Lean in and listen with the intent to be obedient. If you will hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to serve Him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that I will give thee rain for your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed unto yourself that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shall shut up the heavens, as he did. And there will be no more rain, and the land shall yield not her fruit, and lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore you shall lay up my words. Listen carefully. Therefore you shall lay up these my words in your heart. And in your soul, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they may be at the frontlets between your eyes. You ever seen an Orthodox Jew? The ones with the hats and the curly cues? I was in the airport coming back from Uganda one time, and I was watching the clock as a woman was standing uh, seated just not far from me waiting for the flight. And I had another pastor with me, Ron Hall, and I bumped in and I said, watch this, it's almost noon. And I saw the guy open up his briefcase and was fumbling around in it. And he's watching his watch. And at noon, he puts this box on his forehead and he ties the strap. And he wraps his right hand with this leather strap. And he begins to go like this. And he turned toward Jerusalem and began to pray. I had a conversation with him. And time would fail me to tell you it. But after he was done praying, because I asked him, what's in the box? I knew what was in the box. It's a small scroll. And sometimes they can get a small enough scroll where they get 
the whole first five books of the Bible in there. Sometimes I'll just put the book of Isaiah, these modern guys in there, but there's a scroll. It's the word of God. It's supposed to be the front one of their eyes. Tie them onto their hands. And the bigger the box, we're going to see on Sunday morning, Jesus said he put bigger boxes on there to look more spiritual. And they pray louder, and they pray in front of everybody so you can see them praying, so they look more spiritual. And they've twisted and distorted what God is simply saying here. What he's saying is, in your mind should always be the Word of God. Your strength, your right hand that you wrapped up should be and should come from the Word of God. Your life should be based on the Word of God. To the extent, he said, listen, you put it between your eyes. What's between your eyes? Your mind. Memorize the Word of God. Set it to memory. And then he says, you know, put it upon your, and the idea was the right hand, the hand of their strength. Verse 19, and you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thy house. So these are the times you're supposed to share with your children the word. When you sit in your house, and thou, when you walk by the way, when you go for a walk or going anywhere, and when you lie down at night, and when you get up in the morning, and thou shalt write them on the doorpost of thy house and upon thy gate. So when you're leaving your house, you see them. When you come into the house, you see them. Now, when is there a time here not to talk about the Word of God? When you go to bed, when you get up. When you walk, when you set. When you lie down. When you leave your house, when you come into your house. That your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear to your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Now here's carefully the condition. And I, I thank God that we're under a different covenant. I, I just want to finish the next couple of verses and we'll be, well, ma- next few verses and we'll be done tonight. I'm almost out of time. But listen carefully. For if you shall diligently keep all of these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to cleave to Him, then will the Lord drive out all of these nations from before you and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than you yourselves. It was conditional. Under the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, the nation of Israel would be blessed in fact, we're going to get another good dose of this in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you will keep my commandments and walk in my ways and follow my statutes and keep my ordinances and, and obey my commandments, then I will bless you. And for 14 verses, he tells us how he's going to bless us. Then you get to verse 15, and he says, But if you do not obey my commandments and walk in my ways and keep my statutes and follow my commandments, then I will curse you. In fact, he gets to the end of it. If you follow me, everything you touch will be blessed. If you don't, everything you touch will be cursed. What's the condition in the New Testament to be blessed? I just shared it with you in my prayer. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, All heavenly blessings are yours in Christ Jesus. Because once you become a follower of Christ and you're in Christ Jesus, God has washed you in the blood. He's declared you to be righteous and He won't record your sins and He just expects you because He's written the laws upon your heart to be obedient and the blessings are yours. But here they had to perform. Old Testament, you had to perform to be blessed. New Testament, Jesus performed for us to be blessed. And I don't have time to develop that, but but Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and what will be added to you. Everything you need. Everything you need. For if you diligently keep these things, he said, then I'll bless you. Now, let's just read through the next couple of verses because this ties to this. Every place wherein your soul and feet will tread will be yours. The wilderness of Lebanon, this is the borders from Lebanon. From that to the river Euphrates that kind of runs through Iraq the middle of Iraq, the river Euphrates, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. And when you read other places, it goes down and it takes off part of northern Africa, which is part of Egypt, Egypt, especially the Delta area. That 
will be yours. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord thy God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that they shall tread upon as he hath said he will do. Now watch this. Here it is. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. You get to choose. Obedient brings a blessing. Disobedient brings a curse. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, have we obeyed them? We obeyed obey the most important one. If you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. You shall be born again. And when you are born again, you are in Christ Jesus. When you're in Christ Jesus, all heavenly blessings. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I commanded you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. So again, we didn't, well, man, we have three verses, four verses. Let's just, so we can start chapter 12. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whether he goes to possess that thou shalt put a blessing upon Mount Gerizim, and you shall put a curse on evil. Further information comes down the road about these two mountains, but Gerizim means fruitful, and evil means barren. And it's the idea of the curse and the blessing. And they, and are they not on the other side of Jordan by the way of the going down of the sun, that's in the east of the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the, in, in, which dwell in the, campaign over against Gilead beside the plains of Morah. For you shall pass over Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord thy God giveth you. You shall possess it and you shall dwell therein. It's a definite. And you shall observe to do all the statutes and the judgments which I set before you this day. And so Moses is done instructing them, bringing up the past, showing them how they can learn from those lessons. And when we get to chapter 12 next week he's going to be looking forward as they're about to cross over they're on the very precipice of crossing over and receiving all the blessings of the Lord their blessings come through obedience our blessings also come through obedience but it was the obedience of Christ as we find ourselves in him amen what a wonderful thing hey let's stand you know the drill let's get the worship team up here we still gotta I won't you'll only be a couple minutes late but we want to sing our benediction song. Amen? How many are getting tired of it? You wouldn't tell me if you were, would you? How many want grace? Me. <coughs> How many need mercy? How many are glad that God put the law under the mercy seat? How many are glad that He put the man in jar? Because we complain a lot don't we murmur aren't you glad that you're murmuring and you're complaining is under the mercy seat how about your rebellion how many have been rebellious lately a little stiff necked little hard hearted a little wanting to walk in your own ways instead of the ways of the Lord do you know that God still loves you when you do that disappoints him breaks his heart but he still loves you. And here's what he's saying tonight, very simply. This is what I require of you. And I want you to know this before we leave here. He requires that of you because he's done that for you. We ought to be in awe because God chose us. Amen? So he says, I want you to honor me to reverence me. That's what the word for fear means. I want you to walk in my ways and I want you to love me. And I want you to serve me. Because he loves you and he served you. Jesus came and died for you. And those commandments that he wrote on those tablets of stone are for your good. And if you will keep them, they will bless you. Amen. So we want grace and we want love. Correct? So you get to sing it to those people as a blessing and those people over there get to sing it to these people over here as a blessing. So let's do it. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes may the love of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes may the grace of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes may the love of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes may the grace of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes may the love of our Lord be with you now and always may you stay blameless till he comes Lord, it is my prayer that you just bless these people. Bless them, Lord. And keep them, Father, from the influences of the wicked one. Fill them, Lord, with your spirit. Love on them as they love on you, Father, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids that say, amen, amen. All right. If you need prayer, we'll be right up here in the front to pray with you and for you. If not, you are dismissed the fellowship.